The older brother was resentful, he was bitter, he was angry, he was self-righteous. He didn't want his brother to be forgiven. He didn't want his brother to receive his father's grace. Like the older brother, I resented it when my husband, after years of infidelity, repented and came home. People welcomed him back into the fold and I resented that. Why should he just waltz in back into everybody's good graces? Didn't they understand my pain? The nights of tears? What about all that I had done to try to hold the marriage together while he was destroying it? The night of tears, the anguish, the pain. Didn't they understand? He didn't deserve their forgiveness or grace. I was resentful. I was bitter. I was angry. And I was self-righteous. I think if we were to rank sins, self-righteousness would have to come right at the top. Jesus had a lot to say about pride and self-righteousness. The Pharisees were full of it. They didn't show any compassion for the sinner. No grace, no love. They always found fault. And who was Jesus hardest on but the self-righteous religious leaders? But he was always tender with the repentant sinner. I was anything but tender towards my husband. He had wounded me deeply. He had broken my trust. We tried for a number of years to hold it together. I cut, even covered up his misbehavior, thinking that was honoring to God. But the, the, the bitterness was eating away at me. And after 21 years, our marriage ended in divorce. There had been a lot of damage over the years that I couldn't overcome. And um, so now I felt like a second-class citizen. I would always thought divorced people were second-class citizens. God had news for me. I didn't know how to get on with my life. It had pulled the rug out from under me. I didn't know quite what to do. Depression set in like a thick gray fog. And uh, I didn't want anybody to know what was going on in my life. I hid it, so I got, you know, it ends in depression if you hide stuff like that. And um, one Sunday morning, I was sitting in the back of the church, and I'd had enough. And I sort of shook my face at God and said, I have had enough. And I went home, and I looked for razor blades. Fortunately, my husband used an electric razor. <laughs> but it was a wake-up call for me. I knew I needed to get help. And I had been raised with this idea that if you went for psychological help, something was wrong with you spiritually. And I didn't want to add spiritual deficiency on top of everything else that I was experiencing. So um, I didn't want to go see a therapist. But finally, I realized that I needed help. And I needed to seek counseling. And I also knew I had three precious children depending on me. I got help. As I said, the marriage, it did end in divorce. I got on antidepressants, and I will tell you that depression is a physical illness. We have put a stigma on mental disorders. It is not somebody being crazy. It is a physical illness because the chemicals in your brain become unbalanced. As you live under stress for any length of time, they become unbalanced. And um, there are doctors and scientists that God has raised up, medicine that's available. If you think you are depressed, and it doesn't mean you have to sit around and cry all the time. For me, it was extraordinary tiredness. I couldn't get out of bed to go grocery shopping. It was just too overwhelming. But if you think you are depressed or you know somebody depressed, take them to a doctor to be evaluated. And if you don't find the right doctor, go to another one. And get on antidepressants. And it takes time. It, I don't, can't tell you how many 
different kinds of antidepressants I have been on to get the right combination for me. And I once asked the doctor who, who prescribes them for me, I said, am I going to have to be on this the rest of my life? And he said, Ruth, he said, uh, consider it like having diabetes and you need insulin. You're going to need antidepressants because you have this chemical unbalance. That's fine with me. You know, I take antidepressants every day. It's not shameful. It's not shameful. And everywhere I go, I run into somebody who says, thank you for saying that. In this day and age, we shouldn't have to thank somebody for saying it. We ought to know. It's okay. But anyway, that's a, that's a rabbit trail. I got depressed. I got help. And my family thought it would be a good idea if I moved away to uh, get a fresh start. So I moved to be closer to my older sister. I moved from a rural southern town to a downtown southern city. Bad decision. <laughs> Divorced people are very vulnerable people. They need loved ones to come along beside them and hold them accountable. Whether they want to be held accountable or not, haunt them, dog them, keep them on track. They may be ugly to you. They may tell you to go away but don't. I moved to the city and um, moved to, a, and it was a wonderful big church that I could be involved in, and it wasn't long before the pastor introduced me to a handsome widower. And we began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but I thought, you know, it's my life. They're almost out of the house. I want somebody who can take care of me. I, um, I was tired of taking care of things on my own. So um, my mother was in Seattle. She said, honey, slow down. Just slow down a while. My father called me from Tokyo. And he said, honey, he said, let's wait. We want to get to know him. We don't know who he is. Well, I said, daddy, he came to Christ during one of your meetings. <laughs> As if that made it okay. And he gives Bibles out to everybody. But he meets and four spiritual laws and he's always witnessing and, and I knew he could take care of me and, and it was a whirlwind courtship. So after knowing him for six months, I married him on a New Year's Eve. Really bad decision. Within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. And within five weeks, I fled. I packed up what I could in my station wagon and I fled. Where was I going to go? In my willfulness, in my stubbornness, in my sinfulness, I had made the choice that I thought was right for my, like the prodigal, I thought I knew what was best for my life. Nobody could tell me what was best for me but me. And it all came crashing down on top of me. It was a two-day drive. Fears multiplied with every mile. Questions swirled in my mind. What was my life going to be like? What about my children? What kind of example as a mother had I been to them? What was I going to say to my parents? What were they going to say to me? We've, you've made your bed, now you're going to lie in it. We told you not to. We're tired of fooling with you. Adrenaline kept my foot on the gas pedal. Fear gripped the steering wheel. As I rounded the bend, in my father's driveway, he was standing there waiting on me. I stopped the car. I took a deep breath. I got out of the car. And he wrapped his arms around me. He said, welcome home. <laughs>